Good morning, DS class and community and whoever else is here. That's all fine with me. This is going to be what I hope is a half lecture, <laughs> depending on how quick I can get through it. I'm pretty sure I can do it. I hope this is 30 minutes. And I do that because you have two hours of lecture next week and... Though I realize, you know, these are supposed to be three-hour lectures every week, I also think in the dual apocalypse, no one would actually watch three-hour lectures every week. So I'd rather lecture for an hour and people actually watch it than lecture for the full three hours and nobody learned anything, right? And you can see Domino behind me. Elise is also there, but she's under the blankets. Um, so hello from my cats. Hello from me. The new plan, and I think I have this outlined in housekeeping, is that we're going to do Aaron and Shane's videos posted next week, and those are supposed to be fun for you, um, <laughs> and I'm sure they will be, and I'm sure you want a break from hearing me ramble and rant at you every week, so I am, you know, cognizant of that, and I called this kind of readings breakdown for you the aestheticism of illness which i think is still a little bit reductive but it kind of gets at what i'm playing at so the slide says aestheticism of illness reading aaron soros and shane nielsen in critical disability studies as a context and the rest of it is just recording information so if i go to half lecture housekeeping Remember it says half lecture because this is supposed to be a 30 minute video. Cross your fingers for me. Anyone who has not yet completed revised wellness check-in two is now on my hit list. I am kidding. I am half kidding. You're kind of on my hit list, but the extent of my hit list is I will message you on Discord, okay? Because I really do need that information. So if that's you, you could pause this video and go to OWL, go to quizzes, and do the quiz. There's five questions, it takes about four minutes, and all the questions are about you. This is not a tough exercise. So, to get off my hit list, please complete that. This week is read around. I know you already know that because some of you have already been working on your videos, but this is the week that we did a couple weeks ago where you make videos of the right space you edited. Okay, post your videos to Team Private on the Discord server by Sunday at midnight, please. And complete the cheerleading worksheet. They'll complete it for you as well. Submit the cheerleading to assignments when all five members have posted. Uh, some members might not post at all because this semester is really difficult and I respect that. If it's Sunday and only three members have posted, you can just submit the worksheet with three members. Um, if a member posts on Sunday, I need two more days. Maybe just wait for them to post and then hand in the cheerleading worksheet, I'm fine with that. There is not a late policy in this class. So if they need a couple more days, please give them the grace of crip time, okay? Submit cheerleading to assignments when whoever's gonna post has posted, lateness is okay, but I need the worksheet because that's your proof of participation in this activity and read arounds are worth 20% of your grade, okay? So if you're interested, in being graded on that assessment, that worksheet has to come in. Your Right Space 7, the one from last week, Eugenic Narratives, was due on Sunday if you're on regular schedule. Uh, if you're taking more time, maybe send me a ping with what you're feeling like would be a realistic date for you to hand it in. That would be nice. You could also hand it in today. That would be nice. This week's Right Space, however, is a little bit time sensitive, okay? So if you can get it done for this week, Sunday night, please do your best to, because I'm sending your questions to our lovely guest speakers, 
and they get to pick out which ones they want to answer. So if you don't have it done by Sunday and we're recording on Monday, there's not a lot I can do about that, right? So if you're interested in interacting with our wonderful lived experience speaking prodigies, um, you do have to do this right space on time, okay? So I said just the questions that I'm sending to the guests. So the reflection element is private. Like I'll, I'll keep that between us. If you're going to have a hard time submitting questions before Sunday night, please ping me because we can work something out. Okay? All right. Awesome. Who is Erin Soros? From her bio via the Cornell postdocs page, I have taken a quote that says, and I quote, researching psychoanalytic conceptions of psychic energy and psychosis as a response to trauma which is interesting. That is her current postdoctoral research. She has published fiction and nonfiction in international anthologies and journals, including short fiction, the Iowa Review, the Indiana Review, Exile, Geist, Prism, West Coast Line, Fiddlehead, En Route. If you can name a literary journal, she has published in it. So that's pretty neat. And her stories have been produced for the CBC and BBC as winners of the CBC Literary Award and the Commonwealth Award for short stories. So she's pretty good, right? We we could probably accurately assess that she is a fairly decent short story writer. And I really love Erin because she's got a hugely critical mind for post-psychiatry and anti-psychiatry and madness and the relationship between madness and medicalization. And she puts those into narratives that speak to a lot of people that might be critical of mad perspectives. That's what I really want you to get from this, okay? So the selections for our class, and this was really hard <laughs> to choose. Um, I picked I Do, which is a creative nonfiction entry for Room, which is a really great uh, literary magazine. They have it at Wordsworth Books if you happen to be based in Waterloo. I know most of you aren't, but... Fun fact, Room is sold at Wordsworth Books. Uh, and another article called, I call this Institutionalized Rape. And I put a couple content warnings here because this content is heavy. Obviously, if rape is in the title. Uh, but both of them have content warnings for rape dialogue, carcerality or institutionalization, psychosis, dissociation, and involuntary treatment protocols. Okay, so you you know me, I'm going to tell you, you got to set up those safety teams, you got to set up a decompression exercise, you got to set up calling your sister or your friend or your roommate if you're going to read something really hard and you need that decompression or that safety afterwards. If not doing it for you, do it for me because I'll feel better if you have that set up and I know you care about me even though I am just a being that has lived in your computer for 12 weeks, okay? Do it for me. Uh, if you like Aaron's writing, a couple other things that uh, I would recommend or she would recommend is the Letting Madness In entry that she did last year, which is a an activist piece kind of in line with what we were reading about Peter Beresford, who does a lot of very similar activism about moving away from the carcerality paradigm, okay? And the other one is Unhinged, Zoom Crisis Disabling Communication in the Ivy League. So if you really like the higher education lectures we've been doing or all the ways in which academic ableism manifests itself in modern times, uh, she's also written about that. So that's really cool. That's a fun fact. I'm blowing through this. This is awesome. So, liner notes for reading, I do, and I call this institutionalized rape. So this is basically me giving you like a, like a, like a Cole's Notes hint book of what you're supposed to be picking up on and what you could potentially write about for your reflection, right space, which is coming up at the end of this PowerPoint. So keep that in mind. And you can back up and go back to these liner notes if you need to when you're writing this right space, 
Okay. I'll also post the PowerPoint. Pretty sure I always post the PowerPoint. So I said here, she's challenging the CNF for creative nonfiction genre here a little bit with her use of madness and psychotic experience, right? So is nonfiction, and I'm motioning air quotes, a line that we can really draw in the sand. So creative nonfiction is a really interesting genre, and I'm not going to go hyper literary on you because I know this isn't a literary class, but I do have a literary background and it's hard for me to not go literary. So suffice to say, generically, there are some really interesting decisions being made here. And if you want to talk about the relationship between genre and madness and genre and psychosis or what creative nonfiction could really mean in a post-madness society like would that genre even exist kind of thing you can talk about that or how we get to what is creative nonfiction and what is not creative nonfiction. is that a goal to draw that line in the sand that we should ostensibly maintain. I don't know. I don't have a good answer for that. That's what you're answering. I do, the short story, plays with the borderlands of hallucination and reality. And what that basically means is it's intentionally done with a kind of dreamlike cadence where you're not quite sure where you're sitting at any time. And my argument is that that's done very intentionally. And I'm sure you can put together why. Can you trace where these borders, if you treat it like a borderland, are? Is there any significance to where I can assign those lines, if I can assign those lines at all? Fun question. It's a fun question for me. I don't know, maybe it's not a fun question for you. Think about the structure and cadence of these pieces from a more literal place. So if you're looking mechanically at either of these pieces, you can ask yourself what she's doing with stanza, what she's doing with diction, what she's doing with ellipsis. Ellipsis is an academic word for just, it, it's like the three dots or like a kaijura. Um, but you can also use it like a giant line break or a big line, like in we call this institutionalized rape. She uses tons of those. Why? It's not just because straight lines look cool, right? It's doing something there. And I want you to try to investigate what that's accomplishing or what that's doing or what do you hear in your head when you see those ellipses or line breaks or kaijuras, right? The slide also says, Aaron borrows from a lot of pretty hardcore literary theory, and this is true of Shane as well. And for hardcore literary theorists like me, I really enjoy that. But I'm also aware that not everyone's context is hardcore literary theory. But if you do have a background in English literature, we could discuss how post-structuralism or anti-structuralism uh, and particularly Derrida and Adorno, are affecting the way that she creates deviance because there are some really profound influences coming from those theorists and she name checks both of them, right? And anytime anyone gets name checked, you saw from the document breakdown I did last week that that's important, right? They're not naming these people for no reason. And these are really iconic post-structuralist or deconstructive theorists, okay? So if you want to take on that question, you can do that. It also says when you lose your place in these readings or get kind of lost or feel like you're not sure what's going on or you're not sure what's happening or you're not sure where this is going or, you know, question marks appear in your mind for any reason whatsoever, can you pinpoint why? And that might be a distractingly difficult exercise because I can't always pinpoint why. And when I can't get to the why, that drives me a little bit bonkers, right? So I want you to sit there if you're struggling with it or if you're struggling with a kaishiro or a stanza or a line or a, or a clause. 
and try to investigate what's making you uncomfortable or what's making you question that. Because I think that kind of metacognitive exercise is important just in itself in a de facto way, but it's also important to understanding the madness experience as it's being rendered on the page for one kaleidoscopic body mind, okay? I'm gonna take a drink really quick because you can tell I'm losing my voice. Go me. All right, we're halfway through. Don't worry. Who is Shane Nielsen? Uh, from his page at McMaster University, where he was a professor, it says, in part, obviously, Shane believes physicians can alleviate a lot of suffering by detecting mental health conditions in their daily work. Quote, all those years I thought I was a bad person. I went through medical school labeled as a badly behaving student. Disordered, antagonistic, I was overly energetic, and yet there were many times where I could barely get out of bed in the morning. End quote. The medical system can train doctors to better identify those at risk, he adds. Quote, conventional wisdom in medicine seeks to improve our empathy by engaging us in case studies, whereas I regard art as a transformative experience that protects against burnout and allows people to learn empathy." End quote. I think there's a lot there, and you could, you know, pause and try to break that all down, um, but suffice to say, you know, he's living in a kind of duality between having this kind of high STEM degree uh, of an MD, which he got years ago, and then later returning to school to get a secondary PhD in English literature, which a lot of people think is like low class liberal arts or, you know, um, majoring in having philosophical thoughts that nobody can quite understand. Um, which is fine because I'm doing it and you probably know a lot of people doing it. But the duality created, or the binary created even, between these two degrees makes Shane a really interesting subject when he starts writing creatively or when he starts writing articles because he brings a really interesting perspective to his work from seeing things through these really disparate lenses within his kaleidoscope. If we go back to the ableist metaphor, of the kaleidoscopic body mind, right? That's a really interesting composition of a kaleidoscope, okay? So the selections, again, it was really hard to pick. I love like everything these two write, but I ended up going with Why I Won't See You on the Barricades, which is another creative nonfiction piece. Um, and Beauty, with a capital Y, is Invisible Too, which is kind of a philosophical meditation he did for a literary journal. And we've got some content warnings again for eugenic discourse uh, in the context of COVID-19, intensive care, sacrificial ethics, and institutionalization. So kind of most of the same shit that uh, we CW'd for Aaron, okay? So again, decompression, safety teams, making sure you're in the right place in mind to be encountering these readings, and then doing what you can to care for yourself after having encountered those readings. I can't stand behind you and force you to self-care, but know that if I could, I would, okay? So picture me standing behind you saying, okay, it's time to decompress. It's time to call your safety team. It's time to do something other than sit there and stress. And I know me saying that at the end of a semester in a dual apocalypse semester is kind of bullshit, but we do what we can with the tools we have and what we know in the moment, right? That's really all we can do. So what I can do from here in the moment right now is guilt you <laughs> into self-care, okay? So my other favorite selections from Shane, my absolute favorite thing he's done is from this ridiculously expensive anthology that I could not assign because it's a really tough anthology to get and I had to <laughs> get one of my shirk winning friends to buy it for me because it's 
just stupid expensive. Uh, but he wrote a piece for it called The Problem with Burnout, and it's, I love that piece to death. Um, so if you're interested in the relationship between, you know, teaching anti-medicalization ethics and burnout culture and neoliberalist academia, that's a really great piece. He also did a piece for the Routledge Companion to Literature and Disability called Getting There, Pain Poetics and Canadian Literature. And he's done some other stuff, like for uh, the Canadian Journal of Disability Studies. For those of you who are really literary inclined, he does these great breakdowns of pain poetry, because that's what he's really interested in, and he's written his own about that. Um, but I couldn't assign that for this class because I felt just ridiculous <laughs> assigning something so hyper-literary to a classroom full of disability students, because I understand that that could be taken as, you know, incredibly ableist. Um, but if that stuff interests you, he has a lot of great content for that. So, doing it again. Liner notes. If you're encountering Shane Nielsen's material, this is the cheat sheet, okay? It might be helpful, and this is not advice that's meant to go for everyone ever forever. It won't work for all of you. It may work for most of you or some of you. Start with beauty is invisible too, and then keep that context in mind when reading <clears throat> his uh, creative nonfiction piece, okay? And I say that because there are a couple CDS gang or critical disability studies uh, paradigms taken for granted in that creative nonfiction piece that might not strike you on the first read through. So basically there's a lot of information there being kind of taken for granted. And I think if you had followed the first, I don't know, 10 lectures from this course, you'll probably pick it all up. But if you're as burned out and stressed out and anxious and all over the place as I am, you might need a primer before getting what is ostensibly a disability policy crash course in the creative nonfiction piece, which is awesome. But I know we're all, you know, low capacity, low energy, etc. Second point, the meditation, beauty in is invisible too, can be quite dense, but stick with it. The conclusions are critically important for our discussions about policy. Hint, you actually don't need to understand the scope and referential points of Cartesian dualism or Descartesian dualism to understand the points he's making here about gray space and mad environmentalism. Okay, so you don't have to understand every single reference he draws even though I think, you know, Descartes' you know, theory of being is important there. Um, but you, you can get the gist of it without giving yourself a crash course in, you know, mid-Victorian and early Romanticist philosophy, okay? While Aaron is psychotic, Shane's LXP, or lived experience, draws from bipolarity. How, if in any way, did this change their approach to meditating on madness? And you could think of this structurally or philosophically, right? And the more than real experience, so seeing beyond normative reality, right? Are there any real differences in the cadences or the stanzas or the kaishoras or the philosophical bent or anything. Do you see differences there? Can you point to something? For those with literary backgrounds, you know me, fam, the influence of Derrida and Orwell is overpowering. And maybe we could do an essay on just like pain poetics and madness and why everyone who's mad likes Jacques Derrida. That would be an interesting piece um, for like a graduate class. I don't know. You could think about that too. Um, but his Derridian and Orwellian influences here are pretty much impossible to ignore, and he does name check both of them, I want to say. Can you pick out why and how that differs from Aaron's usage of Derrida? 
How Shane and Aaron use Theridian theory differently is a tough question. I will give you bonus points if you actually adapt to that question. I think it's interesting, but I also like Theridian theory, so obviously I'm biased. When he outlines the eugenic dialectic that runs through Canadian triage policy, that's in his uh, creative nonfiction, recall last week's lecture content from Jay Dolmage, the one that we read about disabled upon arrival. How are those strings tying together? So can you draw a line between what Shane's saying about Canadian triage and what Jay was saying about the ways that eugenic realities are being weaved into the coronavirus context. I'll give you a hint. It's a straight line. I just want you to draw it, okay? How are these strings tying together? Can you pick out a few of the echoes between these writers? Can you do it? Not a rhetorical question. I actually want to know. So, with my last four minutes, I'm going to give you some instructions and we're going to look at what your right space is. Okay? So read around two. That's this week. That's happening right now. Okay? It's exactly the same as read around one. You record a video. It can be you with those marshmallow peeps like I talked about last week. I love it. If I got to watch 20 videos of very, you know, high literacy CDS marshmallow peeps, Oh, make my Easter, you know? It can be a weird background. Whatever. You do not have to appear in the video. I am not asking you to appear yourself in the video, okay? Unless you want to. That's fine. With your edited version from the workshop we did last week. So whatever you edited last week, that's what you're reading this week. You are required to fill out the read around worksheet which is posted in the announcements channel for all team members who do upload a video to your team channel. Please do not skip members. That is not nice. This is very intentionally, excuse me, not a criticism exercise. So the workshop was constructive criticism. This is straight up cheerleading. We do not get enough opportunities to just straight up tell each other, hey, you're doing a good job. That's this week. Please tell somebody they did a good job, okay? That was last week. All the rules of being a decent person apply here, same as the workshops. Follow the prompts given on the worksheet. This is not meant to be a challenging exercise. It is supposed to show you the value of writing and reading and recording in community, right? And we can talk more about that. Have fun with it. Writing and reading in community is supposed to be, you know, a, a transfusion of mutual aid and mutually beneficial writing structure, okay? So it is meant to be a helpful exercise. The ways in which your teammates weave together stories should help you metacognitively. So by listening to someone else on your team's approach to a prompt, you can then think about, you know, hopefully, how did I go about that? Or how did I shape my story compared to that? And the comparative is not supposed to be derivative or derogatory insofar as you're not talking about whether or not yours is better or worse. You're looking at the differences and trying to glean somewhat helpful conclusions from those differences. And I'm hoping by cheerleading other people's differences, you learn a little about things you might like to try in your own writing. That's the goal. That's what I'm trying to do here. <laughs> okay? All right. So then I said, taking it further, next week and the right space, there will be two lecture videos, two of them, both of them an hour. So you are doing two hours of lecture next week. You do not have to listen to me very much. It is mostly them, okay? One from Aaron, one from Shane. <clears throat> Those of you who submitted WriteSpace 8, so the reflective questions for this week, by the course deadline of this Sunday, will have their questions, not their reflections, 
sent to the authors, and we are recording um, the questions in the fireside chat component on Monday. So hopefully you'll see it Monday night. You might see it Tuesday morning, okay? You will see the lectures on Tuesday morning. So I've promised Tuesday, <laughs> just in case Monday doesn't come to fruition, but I will try for Monday, okay? And they will be closed captioned. It will be posted to the announcements channel. Your right space nine will be a meditation on one of the two authors you met next week. So that's next week's right space. So you have to watch the videos to complete the right space, okay? Not that that's been a problem in this class, but I don't know, just do it. Right space eight, the one you're doing this week, here's the instructions, and I will post them on OWL. You are responsible for reading all four of the short selections this week. They are short. Some of them are only half a page, okay? Please read them. 500 words about conclusions or challenges you drew and you can use my question prompts, or you can say, I hated all those prompts, I'm doing my own thing, and write your own reflection. That's fine with me. For at least two of the four selections, and at least one from each speaker. So if that's not clear, I want you to choose one selection from Aaron's two, and at least one selection from Shane's two. You can write about more you cannot write about less, okay? Five questions for the speakers. You decide how to divide them. If you wanna do two for Aaron and three for Shane or one for Shane and four for Aaron or um, three for Shane and two for Aaron, I don't care how you divide the questions, but both authors must appear, okay? What do you want to know? What do they deliver expertise on or lived experience about that you find valuable? So based on these readings, what would you ask them? Because you really do get to ask them. And if they like your question, they'll answer it, which I think is really fun. All right. I am a couple minutes over time, but I got really close. So shout out to me. Um, I will see you next week with our wonderful, lovely guest speakers. Good luck this week, guys. I'm cheering for you.